Uh, now, I have to say, we have no time in hand, so we've got to be very, very strict uh, with uh, speeches. Oh, I don't have my glasses. I haven't got my glasses. <laughs> I'm being, I'm being told to the first speaker is I can't find my glasses. Um, what? Right, uh, the next item of business is a debate on motion... Oh, what's that one? It's, it's, one, two, four... Eight, eight, <laughs> in the name of Kevin Stewart on the Housing Amendment Scotland Bill at stage three. And I call on Kevin Stewart to speak to and move the motion Six minutes, please. <laughs> I'll try to find my glasses. Signed off, sir. I'll easily lend you my glasses if you want. I don't know if that would be all oh, you've got them. That's fine. Uh, Presiding officer, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to open this stage three debate uh, on the Housing Amendment Scotland Bill. Uh, I'd first of all like to take this opportunity uh, to once again thank both the convener and the members of the Local Government Committee uh, for their careful scrutiny of the bill to date. Uh, the cross-party support uh, that the bill continues to receive is very much welcomed. Uh, I've been clear all along that the bill is a short uh, but essential measure, one that is necessary because of the decision by the Office for National Statistics to classify registered social landlords as public sector bodies in the national accounts. It will amend a number of the powers that the Scottish Housing Regulator can exercise over RSLs, while also providing uh, min for ministers to limit local authorities' power uh, over housing associations. If the classific classification decision by the ONS was left unchanged, uh, the Scottish Government would face significant financial consequences with all new net borrowing by RSLs, uh, which have previously been counted as private borrowing, now counting against the Scottish Government's borrowing limits, effectively adding £1.5 billion to our £3 billion housing investment programme. Uh, the stage one debate showed clear agreement from within the Chamber uh, that should we take no action to ensure RSLs are reclassified back to the private sector, then we would be putting this Government's commitment to deliver 50,000 new affordable homes at risk. And that is a risk that we simply cannot take. Uh, as well as support from the, within the Chamber, uh, I'm delighted that stakeholders have also recognised the need for the bill and support its general principles. Uh, we continue to work in partnership with key organisations, including the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations, the Glasgow and West of Scotland Forum of Housing Association, and UK Finance, uh, which has greatly assisted us in developing a focused bill that addresses the matter at hand. Uh, President Officer, you may recall during the Stage 1 debate that I confirmed that the Scottish Government would bring forward an amendment uh, providing for the regulation-making powers at Sections 8 and 9 of the Bill to expire three years after the Bill receives Royal Assent. Uh, by way of background, uh, section 8 of the bill gives ministers the power to make further modifications to the functions of the SHR beyond those that the bill makes. I've been clear that we would only exercise the power in section 8 if, when the bill is enacted, the ONS were to conclude formally that the changes to the Scottish Housing Regulator's functions are not enough to enable it to reclassify RSLs back to the private sector. Uh, section 9 is different in the, that we know we will need to use the power it confers before the ONS can review the classifications of RSLs, enabling ministers to make regulations limiting or removing the influence that local authorities may exert over RSLs through any ability they may have to appoint officers or to exercise certain voting rights. Uh, subject to approval from the Chamber today to pass the bill for royal assent, uh, we expect that Section 9 regulations uh, will be laid before Parliament in early September. Uh, whilst such regulation-making powers are a sensible precaution, uh, we took on board the concerns of stakeholders, the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, and the Local Government and Communities Committee, who expressed concerns at the open-ended nature of the provisions. 
Uh, I'm therefore delighted that the Local Government and Communities Committee agreed unanimously on the 9th of May uh, to the Sunset Clause Amendment. And that brings us to today's important debate. Uh, I thank the Parliament once again uh, for the opportunity to speak about the Housing Amendment Scotland Bill and the crucial role it will play in ensuring we can deliver our ambitious affordable housing programme. And I look forward to hearing the views of other members on this important issue. Uh, and it therefore gives me great pleasure to move that the Parliament agrees that the Housing Amendment Scotland Bill be passed. Thank you. I now call on Graham Simpson to open the Conservatives. Mr Simpson, five minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much. I certainly don't intend to speak for five minutes. Um, this is a technical and uncontroversial bill, um, but it is important, dare I say vital, to the social housing sector that this is passed. If this bill does not go through, then it would make it extremely difficult for housing associations to deliver their part in meeting the government's affordable homes target. Uh, housing associations were classed as private bodies for accounting purposes until the Office for National Statistics decided to change their status to public bodies. Uh, the effect of this, though, is that any borrowing they do counts against the Scottish Government's borrowing limits, which in turn means the Government might have to limit what RSLs can borrow, and that wouldn't be good. So to get over this hurdle, you needed to reclassify RSLs as private sector bodies, and consequently, it's then necessary to loosen the powers of the housing regulator over them. And the effect of the bill will be that housing associations will enjoy more freedoms and be, be able to deliver more. Briefly, the bill narrows the powers of the regulator to appoint a manager to a housing association and to remove, suspend and appoint officers. It removes the need for the regulator's consent to the disposal of land and housing assets by an RSL, any changes to the constitution of an RSL and the voluntary winding up, dissolution and restructuring of an RSL, while protecting tenants' rights to be consulted about certain changes. And it provides Scottish ministers with regulation-making powers to limit the influence that a local authority has over an RSL. There was, as the minister has said, only one amendment to the bill at stage two, adding a three-year sunset clause to ministers' regulation-making powers under sections eight and nine. And this was in response to concerns that the Local Government and Communities Committee the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee and bodies such as UK Finance had raised about the open-ended nature of the powers. That shows how uncontroversial this has been. The sector wants it and needs it. Uh, Parliament, I believe, wants it. So we should proceed here today without any fuss. And I'm well under five minutes. I intend to sit down. Well, nobody's pressing you to stand any longer than necessary, Mr Simpson. And I call on Mark Griffin, and you can have a generous four minutes if you wish, Mr Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. I um, think that we have moved on to the bill debate without any amendments um, this afternoon, and that this too will be a, a short and agreeable debate. It shows how much this is um, an uncontroversial and sensible bill uh, to protect the provision of affordable and social housing in Scotland. Labour, of course, will be voting for the bill at decision time. And let me take the, th the chance to thank the parliamentary clerks, the professionals across the registered social landlord sector and SFHA in particular for helping the bill progress so smoothly. Thanks are also due to the minister and local government committee, including my colleagues Elaine Smith, Monica Lennon and Alex Rowley, who have worked on the bill these past few months. I think on paper, we are changing how housing associations are regarded for the purpose of national accounts. And though the effect of today's bill is fairly minor at first glance, it's clear to me that the issue at debate is a thoughtful one about the ownership of housing and how the system is structured to protect social and public housing. And by legislating to protect the future of social and cooperative housing, we are again working to support Scotland's efforts to tackle poverty by building 50,000 more affordable homes. 
And during the stage one debate, my colleague Elaine Smith remarked how she is not naturally drawn to reclassifying a body from the public to the private sector. And I think most of us would take that position too, although we do accept that we must legislate in order to protect both the Scottish budget and the ability of RSLs to, to build desperately needed new homes. I think it's because of Brexit and universal credit that RSLs face new challenges to secure debt and um, build those 50,000 affordable homes. So adding the risk of not acting would simply be the wrong thing to do. The bill would not only change the status of RSLs, but also change the powers of the regulator, and in particular, to intervene in struggling RSLs and to access information. In March, Andy Whiteman rightly spoke about the need to better involve tenants in RSLs. Um, if an RSL has been run well with tenants and not for tenants, then they should have um, absolutely nothing to fear. But there's still more work um, to make sure tenants, the regulator, and local representatives can speak up and get the information they need to challenge management um, or intervene. And given that we've begun a, a thoughtful debate about ownership, perhaps we need to think more fully about how tenant par participation has improved um, or housing associations report. And though lenders will require clear accountability from RSLs, it's welcome that SA SFHA have committed to maintaining current standards and that the government move towards freedom of information. President officer, the, the bill has allowed some space for more debate about the, the housing sector and long may that continue. But for, for today, I encourage members to support the bill so RSLs can get on with playing their part in building those 50,000 homes, and which is what is vitally important if we want to tackle poverty and solve Scotland's housing crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Griffin. I call on Andy Whiteman to open for the Green Party. Mr Whiteman, also a generous four minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. And uh, thank you also to uh, uh, the Minister and to the, my colleagues in the Local Government Committee uh, who have been scrutinising this bill. I think it's fair to say it's not been the most uh, challenging piece of legislation to scrutinise. Never, scrutinize. Nevertheless, I think we have um, done our job uh, uh, well. It's our first piece of legislation on the committee. Uh, I think uh, the next piece of legislation, the planning bill, will, will, will present somewhat different uh, challenges. Um, so yes, this is a technical bill, and as I said at stage one, uh, at that time I agree entirely with the Minister's remarks in his opening statement, and so for the second time I can also say I agree entirely with the opening remarks of the Minister. I also agree uh, with Graeme Simpson's remarks as well. We will be voting for this bill at decision time. I needn't uh, rehearse the reasons um, uh, why. But I do just want to use the next couple of minutes uh, to reflect further on, I think, what we need to do to secure the human rights to affordable warm homes that everyone's entitled to. And as I observed at stage one, collective provision of housing has a very long history. So in Edinburgh, here, for example, uh, the Edinburgh Cooperative Building Company was established in 1861, made up of workers from many different trades, including stonemasons, joiners, plasterers, and plumbers. Uh, the poor state of housing in the old town and soaring prices in the new town meant that Edinburgh artisans were in desperate need of good quality and affordable housing. So the Edinburgh Court of Building Company set, up, set about building their first colonies at Glenogle Park in Stockbridge, and the 11 terraces were completed between 1861 and 1872. And indeed, I think some members of this place and certainly the House of Commons uh, live there. Uh, so offering an alternative to traditional tenement accommodation, the colonies were intended to be flats that felt like houses, so each family would have their own front door and garden, and the cooperative nature of the... Sure. Um, will Mr Whiteman uh, agree with me that it's good to see uh, the likes of the Port of Leith Housing Association develop, develop new colony housing um, in the Leith Port area? Mr Whiteman. Uh, yes, indeed, and I've, I've visited that, and it's very, very impressive, and I think it um, underscores the, the need to have much, much more public-led uh, development of affordable housing to a high standard with, with, with good design. Uh, now, the cooperative nature of the building company is reflected in their motive, their motif, a beehive, the fact that workers could buy shares in the company and the dividends of which could be put towards purchasing a house. 
So over the last 150 years, there have been many other examples of cooperation. Of course, housing associations themselves have played an important role in the housing story since the recognition of housing associations in the Housing Scotland Act in 1974. And so in a debate like this, I think it is important to acknowledge the good work of housing associations, particularly rural social uh, landlords, such as Lochaber Housing Association and Waverley in the Scottish borders, as well as the many urban organisations. Uh, and although today we affirm the value and validity of housing associations as private organisations, we should also be mindful of the need to broaden out the debate on how to provide affordable homes, reflecting in part on the history of the cooperative movement in housing. So I think we do need to resurrect the cooperative principles of the past, to refresh for the modern era by making the legislative policy and fiscal changes to promote them, as well as other models such as co-housing. Um, and as Mark Griffin pointed out, we need full democratic involvement of tenants in housing associations and council housing. And in the private sector as well, and this is important, we need radical reform. In Sweden, for example, the Swedish Tenants Union collectively bargain with landlords across the whole of Sweden over the rents of 1.4 million tenants. That's the kind of gold standard for tenant participation and rent uh, regulation that we should be aspiring to in this country as well. So those are the kind of next steps we need and I look forward to engaging with members on that kind of debate uh, over the next uh, couple of years. But meanwhile, I agree with the general principles of the Housing Amendment Scotland Bill and Greens will be voting for it at decision time. Thank you very much. I now call Bob Doris to be followed by Alec Rowley. Mr Doris, please. <laughs> Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, it was a privilege to be convener of Local Government Communities Committee as this bill made its way through the committee stage uh, within the Scottish Parliament. Uh, and I thank my fellow committee members and other, all who gave evidence in, to the committee, including uh, Mr Stewart uh, as Minister, for the constructive and collegiate way that we approached this, this rather technical bill. But legislation has to be passed. Otherwise, as we've heard, the Office of National Statistics would have reclassified RSLs and taken the Scottish Government's maximum borrowing limits permitted from £3 billion to £4.5 billion. Something because of the constraints of the current devolution settlement would simply be illegal to do. Cuts elsewhere would be required to be made and it would impact upon, as we've heard, amongst other things, our 50,000 affordable homes target. That's just factual. So factually, the bill also has to limit the power of intervention by the housing regulator. It has to limit the presence of local authorities and influence over registered social landlords. And I'm glad to see it has to now have a sunset clause because we don't actually know whether this will do, as it says in the tin, until we actually pass the legislation and then the ONS will make a decision. So the Scottish Government needs that power to act after the legislation is passed to make sure that we've got this right. So I'm delighted there's now a sunset clause in relation to that as well to limit the Scottish Government's power so they're not open-ended. But just as importantly, I'm delighted that UK Finance are very supportive of this legislation because despite the significant contribution the Scottish Government makes to investing in social housing uh, across the country, uh, housing associations, registered social loan landlords still have to go to the commercial sector and borrow money to make up the shortfall to invest in that housing development. So it's vital that UK Finance have confidence. But I think we should have confidence in our registered social landlords. Giving them these additional freedoms gives them the freedom to flourish. And I'd like to point out ways that they're doing that already. But I should point out, you know, as a constituency MSP, that any constituent of mine's uh, opinion of a social landlord is their last interaction with them. And sometimes residents only get tenants only get involved with social landlords when they have an issue. So sometimes we get a slightly nuanced or jaundiced view of registered social landlords in the country. But I'm delighted in my constituency, there's a significant success story of the wider role of social landlords, which they can do more of after this legislation. So for example, presiding officer, the freedom to flourish for me means that NG homes in the north of my constituency can continue to invest in something called the Pit Stops Project in relation to the school of, in, in partnership with the School of Hard Knocks, which gets people furthest away from the employment market uh, together to do a variety of teamwork efforts, actually using rugby as the, the thread that runs through uh, the, the activities that they perform uh, to get them closer to employment. And they've had huge success in my constituency or the sports coordinators that they actually appoint. You know, the Scottish government doesn't have to intervene 
on registered social, social landlords because they're doing pretty well already. And that's the experience in my constituency. And they actually know their communities best. And this gives them the power to do more of that. So, for example, Queen's Cross Housing Association, my constituency, their community chest fund, identifying poverty in their area, not just for tenants, but for wider residents, is a real action that they take in the local community to help their community. I could go on at length in relation to the variety of benefits that registered social landlords provide to the various communities. I won't, presiding officer, because I know we'll start to, oh, we do have some time. Let me tell you some more then, presiding officer. Excellent. So I think registered social landlords have to be empowered more to do more in relation to the regeneration of our community. So in Royston, for example, Copperworks Housing Association, Spire View Housing Association, Blockheim Housing Association, and Glasgow Housing Association, they are effectively doing a local place plan before they even become on a statute of footing under the planning bill in relation to regenerating their communities. They know their communities best, and Cadar Housing Association are doing similar in Cadar with their emerging Cadar vision. I'll leave it at that, presiding officer, in relation to the good work that housing associations are doing. But we have nothing to fear from this bill because registered social landlords are already doing a fantastic job right across my constituency and right across Scotland. And this bill is a technical bill to allow them to get on with doing that and making sure that we continue to invest in our communities and our social housing stock the length and breadth of Scotland. Thank you very much. I call Alec Rowley, please. Sir, it is um, difficult to see what else can be said in terms of the consensus that is in the chamber with, with this bill, but I would thank the minister and the local government committee for the work that they are doing, because as Kevin Stewart said, whilst a technical bill, it is a bill that is absolutely necessary. And if we were to lose 1.5 billion or 3 billion investment that's much needed in Scotland, then that would create a major difficulty, given that we equally all agree, as Shelter has set out on many occasions, there is a housing crisis in Scotland that we need to tackle. And I know the Minister is absolutely committed to working with local government to actually make that happen. Indeed, I was reading this morning the review of the strategic investment plans for affordable housing published by Shelter in February. And it suggests that certainly uh, we are on track uh, in terms of, of building those much needed houses. I would want to highlight that housing associations certainly and in five where is, where is my experience um, have also as they've built new houses over the last decade have also looked at um, houses that are there for people with specific needs so housing associations have been good at building specific housing for older people specific housing for people with disabilities. And as we know, the housing crisis is not just about the lack of housing, although that is the key factor, but it's also that demographics are changing in our country. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry, Minister, I haven't called you Minister. Yes. Uh, Keen I though you are. I, I thank Mr Riley for giving way, President Officer. Um, I agree totally that we have got to get the housing right for the needs of people in various areas. Uh, and I'm very pleased that recently in Fife and uh, in Cooper, um, to see Kingdom Housing Association uh, in a new development there, uh, building housing, larger housing, more bedrooms for larger families, and wheelchair accessible housing. I want to see these kind of schemes right across Scotland. I've made it quite clear uh, that in terms of subsidy, uh, there will be flexibility in that regard for specialist housing and for these larger homes that are required. Alec Rowley. Absolutely, and as, as, as Mark Griffin said earlier, whilst this is a technical bill, it has allowed housing to be debated yet again. There was a time in politics when housing was up there amongst the, the key issues up the agenda, and indeed housing at one point would have been so influential it could have brought the government of the day down. Sadly, it slipped back, and, and, and I do think that getting that back up there. And the specific needs housing that's built 
also has a knock-on effect, and that's where we need to look at um, the types of housing that's being built within the 35,000 social rented housing. Because I don't know if others have had that experience, but certainly I've had an experience when doing street surgeries, talking to people who live in large houses that they've brought their family up in, and they then want to move to smaller houses. But the only thing the council has, has to offer is flats. And why would you, if you'd had a house, a back door, a front door, brought your family up, then in your later years, move to some kind of flat someplace in a different way, uh, a, a housing and living. So, so the more we can build specific housing for older people, for people with disabilities, we will create a chain reaction that frees up houses for families and you actually get more out of the housing stock. Uh, so I welcome this bill because you know, it would have been devastating to have lost that investment. We've got that investment. Let's move forward and let's continue to build on the consensus in this parliament that we should and we will tackle Scotland's housing crisis. Thank you, Mr Rowley. And um, that's the end of the open debate. And I call Mark Griffin to close for Labour. Mr Griffin, please. Thank you, President Officer. I'm pleased that today's debate has confirmed that given confirmation if any was needed at all in fact that the bill will be passed and social and cooperative housing um, will be protected we've spoken again about the importance of and um, of ownership of housing and i'm pleased that we've had um, that discussion i spoke earlier about our ambition to hit scotland's affordable housing target to deliver 50,000 homes by the, the next election. And though we would want to go further than that, the important thing is, I think, putting the conditions in place to deliver that number. And the, the technicalities of the bill might be boring, but the, the legislation secures the Scottish budget and the investment we can make in, in affordable housing, whilst ensuring that RSLs themselves can borrow effectively. The, the protection of the Scottish budget also ensures local authorities can secure grants and deliver social housing to um, in central Scotland. North Lanarkshire Council has set out its plans to deliver 5,000 new homes um, by 2027. And those homes will provide a warm, safe roof over the heads of Scotland's poorest families, but do so um, affordably. And that's why we have to set the right conditions to deliver those homes like housing associations and cooperatives, proceeds can go back into the system, not to landlords or buy to let lenders and, and workers in North Lanarkshire and across the country will, will benefit from the boost to jobs. Uh, President Officer, it's been a, a busy week for housing. Uh, the Parliament has begun its debate on the, the Minister's planning bill and the Government has been lobbied to put ambitious finishing touches to the Warm Homes Bill. Um, I dare say that the Minister has more vigorous legislative challenges ahead um, which are key to delivering um, those housing targets. But this bill, uh, just as much as any other piece of legislation, is vital to secure much needed homes and I'm glad that we have set out our agreement to protect part of our housing system today. Thank you. Thank you. And I now call on Kevin Stewart, Minister, to wind up. If you could keep going till 4.30. I'd be most obliged. Mr Simpson has obviously not taken his opportunity to wind up here today. Um, I, didn't expect, uh, I didn't expect to have um, eight minutes, presiding officer, but I'm sure I can keep going. Uh, and I don't know if I'll wax <laughs> lyrically, but I'll keep going until 4.30. Uh, presiding officer, I'm uh, grateful to members uh, right across the chamber uh, for their very helpful and constructive contributions to the debate. Uh, and again, I would like to thank everyone who has been involved in the bill. And while in some regards it's been easy for us as parliamentarians uh, to scrutinise this bill, um, please give a little thought uh, to my officials who have had to deal with this uh, piece of legislation, uh, which is actually more complex than many would think. Uh, although it's highly technical, uh, it does require uh, a lot of work. So I thank uh, my officials for their efforts um, in that regard. I really do appreciate um, the cross-party support. Um, I think that uh, it, uh, it is uh, going to be easier for me on this occasion to 
put through this stage three than it maybe will be in the future. Uh, but hey, maybe we'll have consensus at a point and, and other things to come too. Um, as everyone knows, presiding officer, uh, this government has a, a clear uh, and defining reason for making housing a, a priority. Uh, providing good quality, warm and affordable homes is vital uh, to create a fairer Scotland, to secure economic growth and to support and create jobs right across our country. And at the heart of this uh, sits our commitment to deliver 50,000 affordable homes over the course of this parliament, with 35,000 of those for social rent. And I'll give way to Mr Whiteman. Andy Whiteman. Uh, thank the Minister for taking intervention. A couple of weeks ago, the First Minister confirmed that the Scottish Government's target is to build, and I stress build, 50,000 affordable homes. Is that the Minister's understanding, and will the report against that uh, target be a report on how many have actually been built? Minister. Uh, President officer, I, I want to deliver more than 50,000 affordable homes. I can only do that with the, uh, the cooperation. Um, of local authorities and housing associations. And one of the things which um, I, I have uh, been known for um, is a, a level of flexibility around about the uh, local authorities meeting the needs in their areas. And some local authorities uh, will uh, buy housing off the shelf. Uh, they will buy back to allow folk um, to move. And I am not going to stop that flexibility. But I hope that our uh, three billion pounds worth of investment will deliver much more uh, than that 50,000 uh, and that we will see many, many more homes uh, built right across the, this country, including um, the housing uh, that Mr. Rowley uh, mentioned in his speech, housing for varying needs housing for disabled people, uh, larger homes. And again, I rely on local authorities and housing associations uh, to make uh, good use of their knowledge through housing needs and demand assessments and local housing strategies uh, to deliver for all of the people of Scotland. Uh, and I'm really pleased that we had the opportunity uh, to debate some of that last night during Joan McAlpine's uh, members' debates. And these debates, <coughs> I have to say, are becoming more and more consensual. And I'm very pleased uh, that that is the case. Uh, during the course of the last parliamentary term, uh, we delivered over 33,000 affordable homes. That was 10% above the 30,000 uh, target. Um, that was a great achievement uh, and one that this government intends to build on uh, with the cooperation uh, of stakeholders. Uh, and we are making good progress uh, on our target, as Mr Rowley pointed out. Uh, the shelter report shows that we are on track, so it's not only uh, me and uh, the government that's saying we're on track, stakeholders are saying that we're on track. However, uh, we cannot be complacent. I will never be complacent uh, in that regard. Uh, recent statistics show uh, that approvals for new housing association homes are up 33% on the previous year, uh, laying the foundations for a pipeline of proposals capable of delivering against the remainder of the 50,000 target by 2020-21. At a local level, um, there are some really good examples of progress to increase the pace of delivery. Uh, the use of public sector land to deliver over 200 affordable homes at the Craig Inches site in Aberdeen. Uh, charitable bond donations uh, to deliver homes for social rent. Uh, the expansion of housing association activity into new geographic areas. For example, Cunningham Housing Association moving from uh, their traditional area of Ayrshire into Dumfries and Galloway. Uh, and uh, housing associations have joined up with others in order to provide agency support for partners with limited or no development experience. Uh, this has allowed more partners who can provide affordable housing to enter the programme and to provide efficient ways of working together to increase affordable housing. Uh, housing associations and councils have also partnered with developers and housing infrastructure grant has been used to unlock housing development in many parts of the country. <coughs> All of this, presiding officer, is of course a testament uh, to the hard work and determination shown by the sector and in particular housing associations 
whose role is absolutely pivotal to achieving our challenging target. Their role is not just about providing uh, good quality housing and services for tenants or building new energy efficient homes. It's also about creating jobs, supporting vulnerable people and acting as an anchor for some of the most deprived communities in Scotland. And I'll take in Ms Adamson. Claire Adamson. Um, the, the Minister will remember attending uh, an event at the BRE in uh, Ravenscraig with myself showing some of the innovations in terms of specialist buildings for people with um, disabilities, um, people with dementia. Um, do, would you like to expand a little bit on, on some of those initiatives that are happening? I, I certainly will, uh, President Officer. I, I, that was a very good uh, visit, uh, which showed could be done to make a house dementia friendly. Um, and we have got to ensure uh, that we use uh, what we are learning in the likes of BRE and in other places and ensure that these technologies uh, and these, uh, this knowledge goes into homes. That way, uh, we can keep people at home and independent for longer. And I'm sure that's something that all of us across uh, the chamber uh, want to see. Um, in summary, presiding officer, um, whilst this bill is indeed technical in its nature, it, it makes very important changes that will enable us to, to continue working towards our ambitious housing targets. Uh, I'm therefore uh, very hopeful, after hearing uh, the speeches today, that Parliament will pass this bill unanimously come decision time. And I hope that our next debate uh, on housing uh, is as consensual as this one. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you very much, Minister. And that concludes our Stage 3 debate on Housing Amendment Scotland Bill. It's now time to move on to decision time. And there is one question to be put as a result of today's business. The question is that motion 12483 in the name of Kevin Stewart on the Housing Amendment Scotland Bill at Stage 3 be agreed. And because this is legislation, we shall move to division. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 12483 in the name of Kevin Stewart is yes, 114, no, zero. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed and the Housing Amendment Scotland Bill is passed. <laughs> and that concludes decision time. I close this meeting. <laughs>